Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. My name is Rudro. I work at uh, Carnegie India. We're really delighted to be able to host this very special afternoon with George Berkovich and Priya. Um, George is really somebody who needs very little introduction, especially to a gathering in India, especially here at the IIC. I think George came first to India, he told me yesterday, in 1992. And it turns out that he stayed at the IIC in 1992. Obviously not in this building, which didn't exist, but the, one, but the main one across the corner. So he's been kind of in and out of India for the last 30 years. In 1999, George wrote what is one of the key standards in basic reading for anyone interested in strategy. I think there was some, there was a student from JNU just now who talked to me about grand strategy, South Asia, India, which is India's nuclear bomb. Um, and I think they said, fair to say, George, that as a non-proliferationist, you certainly proliferated a lot of debate following the production of that book, especially in India. Um, but soon after, George, in 2016, co-authored a book with Toby Dalton, Not War, Not Peace, looking at ways and mechanisms by which Pakistan can be dissuaded from exercising cross-border terrorism. Um, as it, so you know, short to say is that George is no stranger to India. He's been part of the debate for the last many years and seen, I think, huge amount of transformation in the debate, and perhaps in India, over the last three decades. He is currently the Ken Olivier and Angela Nomelini Chair and Vice President of Studies at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Um, it's, I only found out yesterday that apart from everything else that George has done, worked for think tanks, worked in this space, written, um, testified in Congress, in the Senate, and, but in the late 1980s, just as the Cold War was ending, George also served as a foreign policy advisor and speechwriter to one Senator Joe Biden, um, which might be relevant in today's context. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, um, George is going to be um, sort of kind of in conversation, but I believe there'll be a talk based on some of the recent publications at Carnegie on the whole issue of cyber war, cyber conflict, and I guess those are nomenclatures to be kind of defined. Um, and then in conversation with Priya, Priya's on the Carnegie India team, she's an associate fellow, an established lawyer. We're very lucky that she switched from law to policy, which is good for us. Um, so she moved from private equity to the space of central bank digital currencies, payments, and co-leads the tech program with Konar Pandari, who's here somewhere. So with that, perhaps I could hand over to Priya. Thank you, Rudra. And thank you to all of us for joining us uh, today on a Friday evening. Um, if I may take the liberty, uh, on behalf of George, I'd like to promise that we'll leave you with a lot of food for thought by the end of this session today. Um, <clears throat> the talk today is broadly based on a series of papers by Carnegie experts, which examine various aspects of the cyber conflict in the ongoing Russia-Ukraine war. As the preface to the papers note, the significance of the ongoing war in Ukraine, perhaps from a cyber perspective, is that it is the largest military conflict of the cyber age and the first to incorporate such significant levels of cyber operations on all sides. Each of the papers explore a unique dimension of the cyber conflict, from how Kiev's cyber defenses have been bolstered by a coalition of many international actors, including some of the biggest tech companies in the world, to potential explanations as to why the initial expectations of a significant Russian cyber offensive have largely remained unmet, and finally, the overall military impact of Russia's cyber operations. We're fortunate to have George share with us today some of this original research that he and his colleagues at Carnegie's Tech and International Affairs program have been conducting. The research makes a valuable contribution to our understanding of the nature of cyber warfare during conflicts, the, our understanding of cyber capabilities in the ongoing war, and how they may be applied going forward. Importantly, they provide a more nuanced understanding of how we should think about the overall successes and failures of cyber warfare in the ongoing conflict and perhaps beyond. So without further delay, George, over to you. Thank you, Priya. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming. I look forward to the conversation. I want to thank Rudy also for, for having me and for that introduction. And to say that, as I told Rudy and others, um, perhaps strangely, but the International Center is one of my favorite places on the planet. Um, I love this place. <clears throat> and so every chance I get <clears throat> over the last 30 years, I, I try to stay here. I love Lodi Gardens, walking in the morning, in the middle of the day, in the evening. Um, and it just 
is part of my, my fondness uh, for India. So with that kind of happier background, I'm going to talk about what is a human tragedy and catastrophe of the, the war in Ukraine, um, and in particular the cyber dimensions, as, as Priya talked about. And I, and I want to be clear, um, I didn't write the, the papers that we're talking about. My, I would, I've been involved in them, and my colleagues wrote them, and, and they're available uh, online. I urge you to get them. Um, the, the biggest and, and kind of most comprehensive is by John Bateman, and it's Russia's wartime cyber operations in, in Ukraine, and it, it's pretty exhaustive. Um, John is a, a brilliant scholar who uh, went to Harvard Law School and then went into the Defense Intelligence Agency in the U.S. and was an intelligence analyst focused mainly on Iran and kind of cyber dimensions of, of Iran. And then he came and joined us. Um, and, and this is a really uh, formidable piece of work. And then a much shorter one uh, on, on the international support, which I'll talk about and which Priya mentioned, uh, mostly of tech companies uh, for Ukraine, which has been vital in its uh, defense. And so Nick uh, wrote that he's, he's now left Carnegie to go work for BA Systems in, in the UK uh, doing this kind of, of work. But um, he interviewed a lot of the companies and the government. So turned out I'll talk a little more about it. But one of the UK government's big contributions to Ukraine in the war was funding tech companies to defend Ukraine, um, which is kind of a different way to think about the international conflict and maybe a kind of a, a model going forward. And so I think you'll find it a fascinating paper. It's a, it's a shorter read. And then as Priya mentioned, uh, my colleague Gavin Wild, who's a specialist on, on Russia, a uh, native Russian, not native, but a fluent Russian speaker who also has lived in Ukraine. Um, his piece is looking deeply at why Russia has conducted the cyber war the way it has, and which institutions within Russia, they're competing intelligence institutions, basically. And so he kind of under, is dug into um, the way in which they've done it and, and, and how they've uh, thought about it. So quite, quite interesting. And then in three weeks, we have the last of the series of papers, uh, my colleague Eli Levita, who's an, an Israeli um, with long experience in the Israeli government, um, has written kind of a complement to John's piece. Uh, Ellie's piece looks at everything that's been learned and kind of says, okay, what's surprising about it? How, uh, you know, what are issues going forward that people are going to need to think um, more about? And it, it's, a, it's a kind of fascinating, uh, challenging uh, piece of work. So I urge you to get them. They're free. They're online for students. It's, um, you know, it'll be, it'll be interesting reading. Um, what I thought I would do is, is give you a few of kind of the main takeaways that, that we've drawn from what's happened, and then um, some of the questions that I think arise from that, and then we can open it up for discussion. Um, I, I should say at the beginning that, that you have to have um, uh, caveats, or you have to be careful, because the war's not over. Um, so something could change. Uh, in the sense that maybe it's possible Russia has held back something. I don't think that's the case, but one doesn't know, or that they could adapt, and so some new chapter could be uh, open. We have limited data um, that's been made public, a lot of it by Microsoft and, 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 and perhaps some of the other companies that are intimately involved, but there's a lot that we don't know. Again, I don't think that what's not known would change the basic story, because I think if that were the case, it would be known, because uh, somebody would tell it. Um, but but we're not we're not sure, um, and we also don't yet really know what the Russians were trying to accomplish. So maybe this is partly a story about different expectations reflecting different kind of cultural or, or systemic dispositions, and 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 the Russians listening to this or after the war will say, yeah, we weren't trying to use them. Uh, as, as military uh, weapons as much as we were trying to do other things. And I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. But I just recognize that one has to be uh, cautious. Having said all that, I think the top line conclusion so far is that the thought before the war that was widely held both in the academic community, uh, certainly in the West, but I think more broadly, 
was that cyber was what people called an offense dominated domain. In other words, that the offense would have the advantage, advantage in cyber conflict and defenses would always be at a disadvantage. This was um, almost a cliche. It was, it was commonly stated in almost everything that you read and, and what we heard. Um, and yet, that appears to be quite overstated based on what's happened in Ukraine so far. Um, it is true there was an unprecedented number of Russian cyber attacks on Ukraine early in the conflict, in the first few weeks of the conflict. Um, but they had limited impact, so that was kind of a surprise. And we can talk a little bit about why. Um, but then also the, the tempo hasn't been sustained at all, so that the number and level of the attacks has um, fallen uh, a lot. And, and I think even perhaps more importantly, um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about this as a separate item, in the context of an overall war, the, the, the cyber a, attacks just aren't that, that big and significant. So if in the first four months, depending who's doing the counting, there are around 50 cyber attacks, in that same period there were 3,654 missiles that were de de detonated in or landed in uh, Ukraine. So in, in terms of, of, of context, it, it, it gives you a, a perspective. So then the interesting questions are, you know, why has the offensive effect not been remotely like what was uh, expected? Well, there, there are a number of factors, and I won't list them, them all, but clearly Ukrainians and Ukrainian institutions it worked assiduously since at least 2014. When, when Russia took Crimea, the, the, what had been kind of a, a more subtle contest in conflict got more explicit. Um, Ukrainian actors went to work and stayed hard at work preparing themselves, their, their, their systems uh, for this. So, so they were ready. Um, and as Nick Beecroft talks about, they, Ukraine got huge and very quick help from major companies, Microsoft uh, 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 leading among them, but Google, Amazon Web Service, Cloudflare, Cisco, um, others. And, and that, that cooperation, that help um, came quickly and, and in a bunch of ways. So identifying threats, for example, so threat intelligence, helping um, actually encounter countering threats and, and, and defending, helping do procurement, um, managing kind of how Ukraine would organize itself and adapt. And very, very importantly, migrating uh, so much of U Ukrainian, you know, kind of data and infrastructure to the cloud, um, which was hugely um, Im important in all of this. So in other words, within the begin, within like the first week of the war, martial law was declared. And so President Zelensky could then bypass data localization requirements and, and, and migrate, uh, basically migrate to the cloud. And then that provided a, basically a global capacity. So whatever the Russians might do, there are ways um, to prevent it from, from being uh, decisive. And then you have the cloud providers defending. And so you've got all of their assets and capabilities uh, on, on the defense. And, and so it's been uh, hugely, hugely important. Another reason why the, the offensive effects haven't been as great as people uh, might have predicted is that it turns out it's very hard to sustain an offensive campaign in, in cyber. So it takes months, if not longer, to um, identify vulnerabilities in, in your target. Uh, and then figure out how you're going to exploit those vulnerabilities. Lots and lots of preparation. But once you are especially attacking, you may be able, you may be able to get into a system undetected, but Ukraine had been working all these years to detect the Russians, first of all, so it's harder to get in undetected. But then once you use the position that you have in the system, then you're seen and, it's, and, and it doesn't last so long because the defense does what it needs to do to keep you out. So in, as, a, as a first strike or a day one kind of thing, you have an effect, but over time, quickly, 
uh, it diminishes. And it's very, very difficult to then regenerate uh, capacities to get into systems and build new tools uh, to exploit them. And so to do that would require massive, um, in a sense, labor force uh, to do that and, and, and capabilities. And, and, and Russia didn't have that. No one has that. Uh, and, and so it, it, it is a, a, a different way than people had thought to look at the problem kind of now arises, which is, you know, kind of early on, surprise, limited effects, but to sustain a massive war, uh, not, not so likely that, that anybody um, can do that. It's also the case that you can't seal the battlefield. So unlike in physical warfare, you might have ways to keep other people from coming in to, to defend the, the entity that you're attacking. But with cyber, it's very, very hard to keep other people from coming to the defense of the folks that you're attacking. So if you're, if you're outnumbered, in a sense, of the world's view of who's the bad guy, uh, the, 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 quote, defenders of the victim can come and keep coming into the space, and you can't keep them uh, out. And so that's part of the challenge that, that Russia has um, experienced. Another big takeaway, and, and this part's the, the tragic, and I would argue probably the most important part, is once the shooting starts, what cyber can do is, is, is secondary or, or, or even less. So, you know, when, when a country like Russia is launching so many missile strikes and moving, you know, armor in and going into villages and raping women and torturing people and killing people on the streets, uh, innocent civilians, as has been documented, taking down, you know, a, a business uh, 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 website or, uh, you know, playing with data someplace is, is relatively inconsequential compared to what's happening in the physical uh, dimension of the, of the conflict. And, and that become, and so cyber then becomes even more secondary uh, when you fight the way Russia has been fighting. And, and this goes back for a long time. So I remember Chechnya um, and, the, and the pictures of, of Grozny um, when, when Russia basically reasserted control. And basically, they just flattened it. Um, and so if you're prepared to fight that way, then A, why use cyber? Because it, it, you know, the value of cyber, and you can see this in the way Israel has been fighting Iran, for example, continuously, and Iran fighting back against Israel, by the way. Um, the value is you, know, you can be precise. It's not necessarily destructive. You can, you can disable things temporarily. It's reversible. It's not uh, entire or even often destructive. Uh, no human casualties. Um, and, and so it's kind of the antithesis of the way that Russia's been fighting uh, in Ukraine and the way that it fought in Grozny, for example. And so the, the, the lesson of kind of cyber's unimportance and may depend on the expectations and the modus operandi of the people conducting the, the conflict. But if you're willing to be indis indiscriminate, um, then the attraction of cyber, you know, kind of uh, goes away. And so I think that's um, an important uh, element of the, of the whole thing. The third takeaway is that digital, digital networks can be more resilient and robust than people thought, at least before the war. So, I mean, Russia has been doing a lot of stuff, uh, and Microsoft and others have documented. Microsoft has a new report that's just come out, kind of documenting, you know, the thousands of operations that Russia has conducted, probably for intelligence gathering, um, uh, mostly. But the earlier efforts that were uh, attacks um, somehow, and again, thanks to the work of the Ukrainians and, and others, those disruptions didn't uh, last long, and the, and the networks, you know, basically stayed up, and the energy system has has stayed up, um, and so there there was resilience that I think was beyond uh, the prior expectation. Again, Ukraine had a lot of experience, and they were preparing for it. So Russia had shut down, you know, electricity production in Ukraine in like 2016. So they, they knew that that was a vulnerability and, and a target. And, and so that kind of preparation is, is, is very uh, important. 
there are other takeaways in my colleague's work, but those are the kind of the bigger ones that I, that I would put on the table. Let me quickly then try to talk about kind of questions that I think it raises for um, the world going forward and, and those of us who think about these, uh, these kinds of things. Um, one of them is raised by how vital the commercial help to Ukraine was, okay? Uh, and this includes also Palantir, for example, in helping the Ukrainian military target Russian forces. So that was, I, what I was talking about earlier were people defending Ukrainian networks, but also on the offense, uh, companies have, have helped uh, with precision targeting. Um, so questions, uh, if, if that help depends heavily on the cloud, for example, there is a tension between data localization and sovereignty that a lot of countries emphasize, including India, and what you would need in a conflict, which is to be able to have much of your capability not on your territory where it's vulnerable uh, to attack. So there's a basic kind of localization versus cloud question. Then there's the question of commercial actors as distinct from governmental actors. We think about governments being responsible for national defense, but the big reality of, of the digital world is that most of the infrastructure and capability is, is built and operated by private actors, not governments. And, and so then when you're in a conflict, who's, who's in charge, who's making the decisions? It, it ultimately uh, depends heavily on, on private actors. So it's great when uh, these companies come to the assistance of Ukraine, it's been, it's been vital, but the question arises, would they, would they come to the assistance of my country? I, and I'm saying not the United States, but it, I made up a country, Xanadu. Um, you know, are they gonna come and defend Xanadu? What would their criteria be? Uh, a lot of what they've done in Ukraine, they did without pay, at least originally. They did it because people were outraged. I mean, whatever happens in the UN and whatever somebody wants to say and whatever governments want to say, any objective view would say that this was an illegal aggression by Russia against a sovereign state. It's not ambiguous. And so it was relatively easy for companies uh, to decide, you know, we, we, we have to act. Well, what if it's a more ambiguous conflict, which most of them are? Um, what if, unlike in this case, companies have a big stake in both countries, right? These companies didn't have much of a stake in, in Russia, uh, but they have stockholders, they've got management and they have boards of directors whose legal obligation is to maximize the economic value of the company. That's their fiduciary responsibility. So if they say, okay, we're gonna get into this conflict, okay, how is that in the business interest that they're legally required to pursue? It becomes an interesting issue. With Ukraine, it would just happen quickly and people did it and, and uh, but going forward, they're gonna, there's going to be more forethought. And it, and it raises uh, a, a number of, of difficult um, issues. Pricing. Again, people did it without thinking, okay, they were necessarily going to get paid or how to price it. After they've been there for a while, they start thinking, wait a minute, we're laying off thousands of people, which is happening in the tech sector in, in the U.S., but we're providing pro bono work for or discounted work for Ukraine, you know, starts to be a question of, well, if we were charging full price, maybe we keep some of the people we just laid off and what are our comparative obligations? Um, these, these are the kinds of questions going forward. Um, I had very interesting discussions back in October with senior people in, in the French government who, are, who you can imagine are quite interested in sovereignty, it being France, and, and saying, what does it mean that our defense France's defense would depend on American corporations. Um, and, and, and can we count on it? Because if we can't count on it, and my job is to defend France's networks, digital networks, 
but I don't even know if these American companies, and I hate even saying the words, uh, are going to come to our defense. Am I doing my job? And what do I tell our people? And, and then what's the alternative? Because you can't beat the scale that these companies have in terms of being able to assess the environment, assess the threats, and be able to respond. You can't develop that capacity nationally. And so they're quite interested in figuring this out. Multiply that by NATO. So you've got 28 countries in NATO, and they're all supposed to defend each other and pledged if there's an, an attack to defend each other. So what's the role of, of corporations as part of uh, NATO or not? And how do you manage it? We're just beginning to think about these challenges, and, and, and they're going to be there um, going forward. I, I find them uh, fascinating just intellectually, but they're, but they're materially um, very important. Second question that, or the take, that, that I think comes out of this is um, what deters the widening of a cyber war. So Russia has done stuff outside of Ukraine, it's, but a lot of it has been seeming for intelligence gathering. So penetrating, you know, like the Carnegie Endowment, for example, uh, you know, think tanks, other companies outside of Ukraine. Um, we, we know this. Uh, but again, it seems like intelligence. But I know there was a lot of worry they might attack the US energy uh, infrastructure and what's kept them from doing it. I have like my own theories, but it's an interesting question. My, one of my theories is that basically the U.S. privately conveyed to um, Putin that that would be an act of war and uh, it'd trigger Article Five of NATO if if they did that. And so it, you know, you Putin's been very clear wanting to keep others out. President Biden has been very clear that we are not fighting. In Russia, we're not going into Russia. We're not attacking Russia. We're defending this territory. But you know, if Russia attack U.S. infrastructure, for example, that could then bring NATO into the war against Russia. And so you can imagine there's some deterrence in in wanting to avoid effects. And then that raises kind of the question of metaphor and legal issues, which is if you imagine a missile attack on a, on a let's say on a US uh, data center on US territory or uh, a central node in the US electricity grid, if Russia used a missile to attack that, that would clearly be an act of war. And there would be a groundswell of people. We, we have to hit back at Russia and, and you know, go to war with Russia. Well, if they did it with uh, cyber means, how would it be different? I think it would be different psychologically and otherwise, but legally not so clear. And so it's this kind of weird space uh, that, that we're in now. And that I can imagine India being in, in, a, in a conflict. And so how does that make you think about escalation and, and deterrence if it's cyber as distinct from some other um, capability? We don't know, but I think that's one of the big questions coming out of here. Um, One of the challenges, and, and, and Priya was asking me before about this, um, I think Russia has shocked a lot of people by the way it's fought this war and, and how indiscriminate it's been. And the massacre in Bucha and, and, and things like that. People always, it's like 2022 and, and um, like really? Uh, and, and, and so one of the questions is, um, if an actor is prepared to do something like that, what does that say about international law and what the rest of the world does and what those standards are? That was all supposed to be relevant to cyber conflict because cyber conflict was, a lot of people thought of it as, as advantageous or threatening precisely because it wouldn't be destructive like that. So it would be more you'd be more likely to do it because it was below the level of armed conflict. Right? So it added rungs. If you're in a contest with another country, well, let's we can do something with cyber to threaten them, uh, covert sabotage, 
send a signal and it won't escalate and it's in a legal gray space. Um, and I still think that's how the U.S. thinks about it, how a, a few other countries um, think about it. But, but given what Russia's done, if, if there's not a reaction based on international law and there's not accountability based on that, why bother with the niceties of cyber and, and, and being discriminate and, and, and everything else? And so there, there's going to be questions as we go forward, like how Russia is treated and what that might say about the way that war is conducted and the meaning, for example, of efforts to create norms and legal understandings of, of cyber conflict, which people have devoted a lot of effort to. Um, but it, it, it gets called into, into question, I think, when, when, when looking at kind of the international legal dimensions of the war. Um, I mentioned earlier kind of an, another takeaway is that you need much bigger forces if you're going to try to sustain an offensive campaign. Well, if your country, and I mean anyone's country, realizes it can't develop and sustain that large of a cyber force, uh, especially when you're not um, you know, in conflict. So it's for a deterrent and in case you need it, but you would need to have these people deployed and you're paying them and everything else. And they're not useful if there's an internal skirmish or, or something where you can put you know, internal security out there. Uh, who's going to do that? So is, is, is the price of entry going to be actually so high that people decide, oh, we're just not going to fight cyber? War because uh, the only thing we can do is like the first day uh, some useful things and then after that we can't sustain it. Let's just get out of that business. Um, the U.S. isn't going to get out of the business, but it's raised questions about does the U.S. even have big enough capability where you could um, where you could sustain it. That then leads to the other question: Well, do you rely on proxies? All right, and Russia has a lot of proxies. Uh, other countries do. China has a, a lot of proxies. In Russia, a lot of the proxies, at least in the past, have been criminal organizations. Uh, this is true in Iran. So a lot of criminal organizations, and the Iranian state, for example, says, we won't arrest you. We'll let you do some stuff outside of Iran. Um, but when we ask you to do things for us, you've got to do them. And Russia's operated that way uh, with, with proxies. Uh, so if you realize you need a lot more capability, but you can't sustain it on a full-time basis, do you say, well, okay, but if we welcome criminal networks here and, and others, that's how we would fill in the gap. And then what are the, what are the um, implications of that? Problem with that that's worth thinking through is the problem of siloing. How do you control those people? How do you make sure those people don't do stuff that you actually don't want done at a time when you don't want it done because you don't want to get caught and blamed for something that they're doing that wasn't authorized, but they're not in your military commander otherwise, and so you may not be able to control them. So, and India knows this very well with Pakistan. They're always the question when there's been an attack of, okay, were these guys authorized? you know, by the Pakistani military or were they doing their own thing and deniability and all of that. Well, that happens in cyber, especially if you're using proxies. And so what are the implications or concerns that come out of either proxies um, doing stuff uh, that they're not supposed to or, or, or having inadequate uh, coordination with, uh, with the rest of your, with your government? All right, so those are... There are many other questions, and we'll, and we'll get to them, but I think those are ones that have been fascinating for us. I mean, my questions to you would be, what does all this mean for India, or what could all this mean uh, for India? I have no idea, um, and and because I think these are questions that people don't talk about publicly, but governments don't talk about publicly. Uh, I don't know if that means they know and they just don't talk about it, or that they haven't kind of figured it out um, themselves. Obviously, there were a lot of surprises here, so I can imagine that many governments uh, don't know. Um, in the US, there is some nascent discussion of the implications of the things I've talked about for a Taiwan scenario, because the US is obsessed now with the China threat and, and potentially in Taiwan. It's a lot of discussion, OK, if we have a conflict with Taiwan, are the Chinese going to start with cyber? And you know what? And are we prepared to do it? Or are we going to start with cyber? And you know, is it going to work? And what are the implications of that? But I don't know if, for example, here, there's similar thinking or questioning 
about uh, where all this sits in and how will we defend our networks. And again, the role of the private sector here and localization versus cloud and, and what all that means uh, in this context. Um, but I, I, I think it's something that's uh, uh, interesting for you all and, and I think for the rest of the world to think, you know, how, will, how would India process these kinds of issues? Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, George, for those incredibly important <laughs> insights. Uh, I thought I'd start off with a couple of questions uh, and allow the audience, both here as well as online, to sort of maybe take it all in, pull their thoughts and questions together. Um, so I was wondering if we could just step back a little and, uh, you know, the work that you've talked about is why the expectations that the world, or perhaps the West, had in terms of the impact of Russia's cyber operations in Ukraine were not, um, uh, you know, did not um, sort of meet with the expectations, right? So I was wondering if you could perhaps touch a little bit uh, upon where did these expectations even come from? So, you know, you talked about how cyber is an offense-dominated domain. So where did that come from? I think there were a lot of pieces of it, but some of it was any computer, there are other technologies too, but let's start with computers and not toaster ovens. Um, but anything that's connected to networks is potentially vulnerable and a way for bad guys to, to get in and start problems. And we saw this with the use of bots and, and, and other things, and we've seen it with ransomware and before that with other kinds of attacks. And so the thought was with, with billions of potential vectors for an attack and the vulnerabilities of people like me being responsible for the security of my laptop, which is a joke, uh, and multiply me by however many other people, let alone my dear mother, um, that, that you, you've got all of these vulnerabilities, you're never going to be able to, to block the incoming uh, that way. So there was just kind of this intuition that the, 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 bad guy, the, the talented bad guys who know what they're doing are always going to find a way in, one. Two, a lot of the academic work and the writing started in the U.S., and for a long time, the U.S., much of it was secret, but what was known was the U.S. was really, really good at this stuff and seemed like it could get into all sorts of places. And Edward Snowden revealed a lot of it, which shocked a lot of the world, and he didn't reveal everything. Um, but there was a sense of, well, geez, we, you know, we can get in all these places, uh, and the defender you know, doesn't have much of a chance. There was Stuxnet, the U.S.-Israeli operation against uh, the Iranian centrifuge uh, facility. It's like, okay, that, I mean, that's Iran. It's a pretty closed place. These, these things weren't even plugged into the Internet. Uh, and somehow, you know, these guys got in there and stuff so that the offense is always going to have a way. And so I think that was uh, a, a, a big part of, a part of it was just kind of the logic that you're always going to be, the defense just can't, keep up. Um, and, and then this has happened, and, and I think there, again, a big part of it is the cloud, people factoring in. So you had these highly capable, highly resourced companies, basically, who spent a lot of effort figuring out how to defend and gather intelligence on what was happening. Um, you know, made a difference along with uh, along with other things that I don't understand. Yeah. I think uh, in one of the papers, I think it's Gavin. He mentions how uh, perhaps one of the takeaways is that uh, um, you know, cyber warfare is perhaps not akin to warfare on land, sea, air, space. Right? There's, it isn't the fifth uh, sort of uh, domain, so to speak. Um, so I'm wondering if, given that. Um, is there a paradigmatic shift now in, a, in the way that we should be thinking about cyber warfare? Is that something, is that a conception something that is static? It, I think the, the second part of your question, Priya, is the easier one to answer, which is no, it can't be static. I mean, it, 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 things will change. And, and part of it is because we don't know is, is this, is what's happened an exception and, and is it an exception for a combination of reasons? 
which could include that the Russians actually didn't intend to, the, the Russian conception of cyber wasn't to achieve the kind of effects others might think about when they're, when they're going to war. In other words, that, and Gavin writes about this, and, and my colleague Ellie will be coming out in, with his paper that talks about it, is that, you know, in, in, in every country, a key, a key value and priority of cyber is to gather intelligence, right? So that's, a, that's vital for everyone. And the Russians have been doing that in Ukraine and in the NATO states looking now to see, so Microsoft's latest report that came out in the last couple of days talks about there's a lot of activity that appears to be Russian intelligence gathering in NATO states trying to figure out what NATO states are going to supply to Ukraine and what assistance is coming to Ukraine. So it's not interpreted that Russia is going to strike, but that they're trying to gather intelligence. So clearly intelligence gathering is vital for cyber, and that's that wouldn't be expected to change. But the other thing that's been noticed is that Russia didn't integrate offensive cyber operators into their military commands. Um, each of the military units has electronic warfare capability, and Russia has used electronic warfare on the battlefield, so to jam Ukrainian communications and, and, and weapon systems, but it's kind of old-fashioned electronic warfare and not cyber operators and, and cyber warriors. So Russia's cyber capability has been largely confined to the two big intelligence agencies, the, um, the GRU and, and the external uh, in, intelligence service, um, who, do, who do some covert operations, um, but basically either intelligence gathering or they've been focusing a lot on domestic political control. So it's more influence operations, information operations, monitoring their own potential dissidents to figure out who might be critiquing the government so you can go take care of those people. Um, and so they haven't, it doesn't appear that they've been trying as hard as one might expect to use offensive cyber capability because their model of warfare is just different than how, for example, the U.S. has thought about it or Israel has, has uh, thought about it. And so that's one of the, the premises here is that Russia may be different. But then it raises the, and I'll, I'll shut up, but it raises the other question of who else are we talking about? In other words, you, you've got the U.S. And, and Israel, you've got Russia, you've got China with some large capability. You've got Iran with a lot of capability who's been engaged in, in, in cyber war with, with Israel. Uh, North Korea has, has, is one of the big actors, but again, they've largely been doing um, you know, theft to fund, to fund their, their system. Um, but who else are we talking about? So maybe this is a generalization when we talk about, when people like me talk about cyber war capability, and you're only talking about five or six uh, uh, countries, and, and everybody else is kind of, we're not going to do that. We'll do, do something else. So I don't know, to be determined. Thank you, George. Um, I, I'm happy to open up the questions. Yes, please go ahead. No, I'm <coughs> Major General P.K. Malik, a retired uh, Army officer from Indian Army. Uh, I have got a couple of issues. You have mentioned about the role of big tech. You know, just before this conflict, there were other conflicts also, like Gaza, like Armenian, Azerbaijan. No big tech. What is that? It is the big techs are American software companies. They will only do what the American wants them to do. I will just the box say, think tomorrow there is a conflict again between Israel and uh, in Gaza. And Hamas is a terrorist organization. What happens if China and Russia's cyber capabilities go vigorously against Israel. Second issue is, you know, uh, you have brought out conventional war. If you, if, if American soldiers or others were in Ukraine, it would have different connotation. But uh, Naka, General Nakasone, US NSA chief, has no qualms in saying we are there in Ukraine. Their people, the NSA and Cyber Command people are inside Ukraine. 
So how far you can push this envelope? You know, you, you, you do not want to be present physically, but you are present not only from USA, you are physically present, your stuff, your cyber command people are physically present in Ukraine. Third point is, you have said, okay, uh, if somebody does a cyber attack in some, some installation in USA, it is a dicey thing. But US has already done it in, as you said, in Stuxnet. Why I'm trying, trying to tune all this? To put in the correct perspective, it is not all US. The other, tomorrow there is a war between, say, two countries, and USA wants to be a neutral part. Why will this thing, uh, why these big tech companies come? Thank you, sir. There we go. Thank you, thank you. I think it sort of uh, um, takes us back to, I think, some of the questions you had in terms of how other countries should think about the fact mm -hmm. that the companies that have played such a vital role, mm -hmm. being American, mm -hmm. how will other countries think about mm -hmm. this? And we have, uh, you know, representatives of some of the tech companies here, so please feel free to sort of jump in if you have any observations there, there, on that front. There, there, there are a number of interesting issues there, but there, but there's, it's quite possible, for example, that that companies, which happen to be American or otherwise, are operating in a country that's attacked, and so they have an obligation to their clients to defend them, which isn't really in your question, but that's, you know, I'm, I've got a business and I'm in country X and I'm attacked, I turn to my contractor and say, you gotta defend me. So there they are. Uh, is that wrong? I don't know, I pay them to defend me. Um, US operators are in Ukraine, yes. Ukraine's a sovereign country. It's asked people uh, to help uh, come to its defense. Why not? It was clearly an illegal aggression. Uh, these operators are not uh, attacking or haven't been known to be attacking uh, Russia. They're defending. I don't see anything wrong with, uh, with that. And if Indian companies were going to Ukraine to help defend Ukraine from attack, I don't know that anybody would see anything wrong with that. Um, so I, 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 it raises dilemmas, but but there's different degrees uh, of of the dilemma in a, in a sense. Um, and in and in some of what happened in Ukraine, it wasn't you know that Ukrainian con the contractors of Ukraine weren't going to, people were volunteering to come help again because I think there was there was outrage at the situation, and that may not be repeated. Uh, in, in other situations. And that's one of the big questions, for example, about Taiwan. It's a question that Taiwanese have uh, as well, because companies have a big stake in, in China for the most part. And so that becomes a very different question from the standpoint of your stockholders and your board of directors and even your employees of, you know, do, do you do it in that, in that kind of uh, conflict? Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I think they're, they're, in each of these, there's they're, they're difference. But I don't think there was a legal issue. Yeah, yeah I have a small, uh, hey George, Sandeep yeah. here. Hi. I work with Microsoft. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, what is the, you know, from this episode, what is the learning for India? Uh, and a lot of, you know, a lot of traditional defense planning happens by creating deterrence that I have this cache of weapons, don't mess with me, right? So what can, you know, India, US as part of ISAT or the four countries as part of Quad do to build that deterrence that bad actors don't mess with this group saying they are powerful, let's not go there, right? Or they have capabilities. What do you suggest to India? You know? Sandeep, I have no idea. That's why I was looking forward to coming here. Is 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 because I think it raises really interesting questions. Like I said, I, the conversation we had in Paris in in October was fascinating. I have no answers, but just sitting there with these guys, and I'm very very senior generals and and civilians, and they're all they're all saying. This raises such profound questions. We haven't begun to think about them, let, let alone know what the answers are. And so I, my response to you is that that would be a great thing to put on the bilateral agenda and the yeah. think tank agenda and others. Like, 
it's not clear what the answers are, but at least like let's let's start asking the questions of, of ourselves, like what is this because if it happens, you know, have we at least like thought about what the likely questions are and who's going to get called and, and but I have nothing like an answer. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, thank you. My name is Anurag. Um, I'm from Vivekananda International Foundation. Sir, um, you somewhere mentioned that, um, if I correctly heard you, that large cyber forces required to sustain the offensive campaigns. Um, so if you quantify the large cyber force, do we exactly mean the, uh, the best way is the decentralized force of the highly skilled people like we have seen uh, in the Ukraine-Russia uh, conflict, when uh, one of the Ukrainian uh, ministers have called upon all the cyber skilled around the world. And similarly, the terror group Islamic State also have a decentralized cyber army, and, and, and not to forget the anonymous group. So how do you uh, define like large cyber force, state-sponsored state cyber force, or the non-state actors in the decentralized form? Thank you. Again, uh, a, a question I think for others to address and answer. I, I think there's a difference also if you're planning an offense and wanting to have a coordinated campaign that's related to your, your conventional forces too, you, you would need a lot of capability and, and a lot of, of coordination in a way that you wouldn't get with a decentralized capability. Because you want to be able to plan and, and understand that this air defense is going to be taken out by this cyber operation or group. And so then we can put the, the planes there and it's integrated and you, and you have a sense of what everybody's supposed to do, how it's going to be do, done and, and, and when. Which is quite different from um, disrupt whatever you can uh, or you know deface websites and provoke uh, people or do influence operations and here are the basic you know images that we're using which you can imagine you, you get a bunch of hackers to just go and if three of them succeed that's great and the other 12 you, you don't care so I think it depends on a lot on what you're trying to accomplish um, and what I was talking about is is it in a in a major warfare an aggression like what Russia was talking about you're talking about taking over a country um, that would require a lot of, of planning and sustained uh, capability, is, is what I was in, envisioning. Or if you were China and you're thinking about, um, I don't know how you would think about taking over Taiwan, but you, 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 you're, you're figuring out how to displace the Taiwanese government and put in friendly actors uh, there. That's a big campaign where you would be thinking about it and you know you got to control take control of all the media uh, outlets and capabilities and what else do you need to control and you want to have capacity to get people there to be able to land it, it's got to be quite coordinated and, and plotted and then you have to think okay so when they respond then what do we keep uh, doing and so that's that takes a lot in, in reading on this I, I learned the U.S. Cyber Command, I guess, has something like 6,500 active personnel. That's, I don't, on the one hand, that's kind of a lot. On another hand, it doesn't seem like, you know, much. It's, you know, like half a division or something. I mean, so, but that's probably, you know, there's certainly nobody in the West has anything like, like that size capability. And, um, and so if that's not sufficient, which is, we don't know. Uh, it raises the question: Okay, who else wants to play that that game? Yeah. yeah. One of the takeaways from the papers is that the cyber and kinetic operations were not coordinated. Yeah. 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 Um, so first, you and then Ambassador. Uh, thank you. Uh, and then. Greetings, Mr. Pogovich. A uh, lot of insightful comments today. Uh, my question revolves around uh, global norms. Uh, especially around cyber attribution frameworks and policies. We have seen uh, a lot of developments in the last year. Uh, my question uh, is, uh, currently when we see how cyber attribution is taken uh, around the world, in India we do not have a policy, uh, we do not comment, um, we do not comment on the states. Uh, 
US has a different policy. For example, it has, along with the UK and Australia, uh, uh, been attributing through collective cyber attribution uh, pub, uh, in public. France has a different model. So how do you think cyber attribution policies will evolve given how the developments have been in the last year? It's a great question. And I, I, I don't, I'm not sure how I feel about what I'm about to do. But um, we have a paper uh, <laughs> uh, that's on our website that we did as part of a, a, a collaboration with the Shanghai Institute for International Studies. So we've been doing several projects with them. And it's on public attribution of cyber. And, and so I urge you to look at it. Because China's had a very different view and been very upset by US public attribution, especially when it's attributing things to, to China. And so we had a couple of years of dialogue um, with Chinese counterpart, trying to understand kind of, again, what was agitating them and how one might uh, approach this. And, and so we went through several questions, which I think you'd find interesting. But what became interesting through the course of it is by the end, the Chinese were starting to change their view on attribution and, and, and starting to see why it could have some value and that they might want to do it. And, and that evolution came as Chinese private companies, cybersecurity companies, started getting capability and were doing attribution, um, much like CrowdStrike or Mandiant uh, do. And so when it's Chinese companies starting to do it, analysts in the government started saying, well, OK, I mean, this might, this might make sense, might not be so bad. And it, and, uh, it evolved. Um, so I, don't, I, I, I think that will be, again, an evolving um, issue, number one. Number two, and, and maybe our friends from Microsoft or other companies here, can, they can certainly speak better to it than, than I can. But the capabilities have improved to have more confidence in, in the attribution. And so I think that changes some of the dynamic. And then there's last thing I would say is there's a broader, I don't know if it's a trend yet, but you might have noticed in the US at least, before the war, the US went public with intelligence saying, we believe Russia's going to attack Ukraine. And wouldn't have done that in the past. But there's a sense, and it relates to the, what I was talking about of private companies, there's a sense that, that with technology the way it is, a lot of it open source capabilities are allowing people who really want to so much information and intelligence that it might make sense for the government to put out what they know like sooner to shape the story and, and, and the narrative. So there's starting to be more of a, of, a, of a kind of attribution mindset or a warning mindset than used to be the case. Um, and I think it's related some, like I say, to losing the monopoly on the capability so you'd rather get it out there first than, than have other people try to start telling the story, and then you're trying to catch up to it. And so I think that would all make attribution more likely. Could I just go quickly there and come back? Yeah. Please, go ahead. Thank you. We need to switch on the. Maybe there's too many on. Sometimes it's when there's too many on. You you raised quite a few fascinating uh, issues, uh, Rob. Um, and, and one of them was uh, at what level do just private sector and other people think about stepping in, right? Um, in, uh, you know, what was really interesting to think, uh, I guess, one of the points was maybe it's when there are business interests, but it could be also other interests. I don't know whether that that defines a possibility of creating certain norm, global norms where which requires people to start stepping in or leaning in, irrespective of whether they are business interests or other interests. And, and maybe that could be a discourse which, which is required. I mean, and the only leaf I'm taking out of this is that uh, many, many years ago, sustainability was a fad which people you know, thought about. Today, it's become a necessity for every organization, civil society, business interest to really lean in on sustainability. And given the way the cyber warfare is progressing, maybe there is a 
call for norms. That's one, uh, that was just one thought. The, the other point that uh, uh, you raised another very interesting aspect that if the Russians, for example, had attacked on the US soil a data center, that would have been an, with a missile, it would be an act, act of war. If they attacked through a cyber attack, would that be an act of war? In, in conventional warfare, in a kinetic war, if you, if you go into a territory of an organ, a country and you hit any establishment, that typically that establishment service that services that country, whether it's a thermal power plant or a nuclear power plant or a, or a dam, etc. In today's world of cyber, a data center which is located in any country typically doesn't just serve that country. So I'm just adding to the complication of the question. If there was in Ukraine, for example, an Israeli data center which services the world, which could mean also countries like UK and the US, and the Russians attacked it or destroyed it, and hence decimated certain capabilities of certain organizations or even the government possibly in UK or the US or any other part of the world, would that be taken as an act of war by the UK, though the, the infrastructure was based in Ukraine? I mean, I'm just trying to add a little bit <laughs> complexity the, to an already complicated situation. And those were great examples of, again, the challenges that I think we all face, and, and especially I'm looking at the students, you know, it, 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 people coming up through university and <clears throat> think tanks and others. And in each of the case, the question about norms, because they're, the norms that have been discussed mostly thus far had been peacetime norms. So there's a UN group of governmental experts who negotiated, you know, five or six iterations of cyber norms, but they always said peacetime. And then, and then one of the questions then was, well, what about the gray zone? Like, because a lot of what goes on is neither in war nor nor peace. So Stuxnet, but there's not a war with Iran, but it's, you know, uh, here's unambiguously a, a war, uh, and so you think international law applies, let alone norms, but how international law applies to, to cyber is a little less clear. So I, I'm just affirming it's an interesting set of questions. The, the second question about the data center is really fascinating. I have no idea what the international legal issues would be. I mean, among them would be, well, what's the obligation to know who's served by the data center, and does the owner and operator of the data center make that public even? And is it their problem then? But I know this has come up also with regard to satellites, and because a lot of the similar issues are now coming up, right? And so what, the most effective Ukrainian attack was on Viasat, yeah. the, on the first day of the war, nearly the first day of the war. Yeah. And that was a private US company, but it was serving uh, Ukraine. The Russians have issued statements saying, you know, that these uh, satellites are uh, fair game because they're being used to target uh, Russia. And the U.S. is saying, well, these are private, privately owned, you know, satellites. These are companies, et cetera. And the Russians are saying, but wait a minute, that, you know, that's your problem. They're being used to attack us. They're a legitimate target. I have no idea uh, what, what the it's not truth, it will be constructed, what the international community will decide about uh, that. So that's taking data centers and then adding to it, okay, let's talk about satellites too. Whole new area um, that, that you all, uh, I'll be retired, uh, that, that you all are gonna have to really wrestle with and it's really fascinating. And it isn't gonna be sufficient for us to, for, for Americans to decide or agree, or for Indians to come to an agreement, here's how we think about it, because you're gonna have to negotiate it, you know, with the Chinese, with, with other people for it to be meaningful, and it's gonna be very, very uh, interesting. You know, like the major was talking about, you know, these are American companies and so on. So that'll be part of it, it's like, well, what, you know, well, we're not gonna protect these, these are American satellites, the US owns the technology, but what about when it's other people's satellites, uh, does that change the way that you start thinking about it? Or they're your satellites, uh, and, and it, it becomes a different uh, issue. All new terrain, um, we're, we're, we're just beginning uh, to think about it, and, and not clear what venues even that you do this in, right? So the UN's broken in some, in some 
way where, you know, CD hasn't, Conference on Disarmament hasn't done anything in, I don't know, like 18 or 19, I don't know how many years now. Um, I mean, it's a nice job to be the ambassador there, uh, right? Some of our best friends have done that. You go, you sit on the lake and you don't do anything, you have coffee and, you know, um, and nice house. Uh, but, you know, so there are these questions that, that we'll have to address, and, and you raise them very well. I can just applaud the question, yeah. Ambassador, would you like to? Uh, George, thank you for a very fascinating account. You posed many dilemmas, policy choices for different governments. But I think in the process, uh, the US government itself will be faced with a major policy question. Because today, for example, when you supply weapon systems to other countries, it has to go through a whole process in the Paul Mill Bureau of the Department of State. You notify Congress. You need to get congressional approval. Then you do end use monitoring with those requirements. So given that, if your private companies are to get involved in conflict as they have, shouldn't there be a process requiring government and congressional approval? Otherwise, how would they be different from private mercenaries getting involved in a conflict? Ambassador, that's another great question, and I don't I, I'm not aware that Congress or others are kind of systematically raising that question and deciding, okay, we should address it. I think that's part of the frontier we're on that would have to be done. I, I despair of the current Congress doing that in a serious way, but um, but I think you raise, a, again, a very important question. I was doing, a, um, it's a longer story, but anyway, for, for, for weird reasons, I was reading a book that my favorite professor as an undergraduate had written in 1966. I just found it and I was cleaning off a shelf. And, and he's writing about World War II and, and I hadn't thought of it, the mobilization of companies for World War II, all right? So you think about you know who's making all the Jeeps and the uniforms and preparing the food for the soldiers, just all private companies. And I, so I thought about it in this context. And so he's talking about they created all of these commissions who, who, and, and the business executives from these different companies volunteered and they moved to Washington and they figured out how to mobilize for the war and what they should charge the government, right? Because government bureaucrats didn't know what this stuff would cost, so they kind of asked groups of the companies to come and say, all right, what's a fair price you know, that we should be charging for this? And it was this huge wartime mobilization. There was some controversy to it, like, but usually from companies that were left out of the board that was you know, trying to uh, uh, produce it. Um, but it kind of forgotten history as far as I knew and, and until I saw it. And I thought, okay, this is interesting given the current circumstance. But these were all national companies. They weren't like Microsoft or Google that are operating in hundreds of you know, odd countries. So it's like transnational effects. And, they, and it, it, so it's, it's a, it was a much simpler issue. But even then, it seemed like it was really complicated. And now we've got it, uh, you know, it's so much more complicated. So I'm just affirming in a sense that this is serious stuff that people need to think about by we just beginning if if that yeah another great question Rudy would you like to go ahead yeah George I mean I really don't know anything about cyber stuff so these are just kind of musings but I just think it's some three points right I mean just on the cyber norms and law I was just wondering sometimes if we overcomplicate it so if I had to just think of another hypothesis which is I mean, you have a whole bunch of people in the United States now saying that by 2027, the Chinese are going to move on Taiwan. I just wonder if that were to happen. God forbid you had, hypothetically, some kind of a war, a conflict between the two countries. Where would that leave Intel and others inside of Chengdu in China? Right. So totally different dynamics, very different technologies. But at the fundamental basis, I think the questions are the same. It's about global companies operating in different mm -hmm. jurisdictions where at one point the geopolitics favor those investments, now they don't. So do you transition, do you diversify, or do you stay? What we've seen even with geopolitical disruption is the diversification is limited. Apple has capital and technological capital in China that's going to be very difficult to move out to almost any other jurisdiction. They can move mobile phones to India, $700 million, Vietnam, so on. So I guess I just wonder if that in the cyber domain, sometimes if we can make get some clarity going back to the fundamentals and looking at other industries, and obviously, cyber is much more proliferated, so it's more complicated. And a second, I think for India, I think the one thing I'll turn around to say is that one is, of course, you've got big tech companies, but I wonder for us, it's as important to think about 
our largest, I mean, just look at our GDP. I mean, our largest companies are our services companies on technology. TCS is as integrated in the United States and the United Kingdom in London and in Europe, right, as it is in India. So the problems when we say big tech companies and our national dependence and sovereignty, but the same can be flipped when you talk about French sovereignty or British sovereignty. So I just wonder if, that, if this opens some kind of a pathway to be talking about companies, lawfare, norms. I don't know who's doing it, but maybe cross Carnegie we should. Um, so that's just, I guess, too, but it's worth thinking about from our perspective that, you know, we're talking about capabilities that could easily be harnessed by Indian companies. I don't know if they do. I have no idea if Infosys has these capabilities or TCS, but I'm guessing it's something to think about. The third I was just wondering is that in Europe, it seems that some of the, the argument with regards to sovereignty, the need for capabilities which may not be yours and dependence is being solved for by a kind of, you know, something like a cloud stack. Right, so in India, we talk about India stack. I just wonder if you think about a cloud stack. But basically, you've got, so Germany, for instance, I only learned recently, has a national company um, based in, the, in Germany under German law that creates the critical infrastructure for their data. Um, but on top of that, you have multinational companies that build on top of that. So they're basically hedging their bets. Right? If I look at 5G architecture in India, we're, from what I understand of 5G, we're hedging our bets. You have one layer by NTT, Japanese, you have one layer by Korean, Samsung, and you have one layer which is maybe on the top of Indian. So I was just wondering is that at some le level, you know, lack of a better term, but will everyone have to be non-aligned in order to be secure? All great questions. I mean, on the last one, <coughs> it, some of that, and I think <coughs> it's probably true in the German case, is, is, is it's politically driven, so you might have to be non-aligned to be domestically politically secure, uh, because you, it, it would be too hard to say that you've, you're dependent on a, a non-national company. So you put a layer of a national company there to be able to say to your right. opposition in parliament, no, 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 it's, it's German. So I don't know how much it's functionally required as opposed to a, a political layer, which, fine. Um, the, the question about like, for example, if there's a war with China, what about U.S. companies? Are, yeah, I, I, I think that's, that's just a reality that companies wouldn't try to solve by leaving entirely in case there would be a war. I mean, to me, my answer to all of this, and, and, and um, it's kind of forgotten in the U.S. now, is like, yeah, that's why it's really a bad idea to have a war with China, um, you know, and we, we forget about that. It's all now about, you know, kind of being relatively aggressive and you come, and it seems to me the highest priority is for both countries is like, let's not have a war and like, let's remind ourselves that everybody's going to lose uh, if we have war. The Chinese are going to lose. Um, they need our market uh, um, amongst uh, other things. They need Taiwan semiconductors. Um, there's a long list, and we're kind of for, forgetting that. And so you just kind of added an example. And I think our companies know that, but they're kind of afraid in this environment <clears throat> where everybody's kind of, you know, let's get uh, tough. So people who think differently are kind of laying low, but they're not leaving because um, they, they, they can, and they, and they probably shouldn't. Um, I'm trying to remember... It was Cargill, I think, but some, but Ambassador you and others will remember. I think it was during Cargill when U.S. companies started leaving India, and and I remember, in other words, between between. I think it was early two. It was early two thousand and two. It wasn't Cargill. It wasn't Cargill. It, it was two thousand two when the big mobilization was happening and it was going on for months, I remember companies started pulling their people out and there was a big diplomatic thing of would the US government send out a notice to companies that they should start withdrawing their, their people. Um, and obviously India didn't want that to happen and so it was, I, I remember this is going on for quite, quite a long time and I think some did leave. Um, but it raises a whole lot of, uh, of issues, not just for those involved, but for the government. So I think to, to do that 
at the scale that we're talking about uh, with China now would be uh, people would be reluctant um, to do that. But it's another interesting question that comes out of all of this. Yeah. I think there were a couple of hands. We have, I think, time for just maybe two questions. Uh, let me start with you. I think you have a hand up. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Rahul Rawat. I'm a PhD student in Diplomacy and Disarmament Division at JNU. Uh, as we see, following this discussion, Ukraine war, war in Ukraine has become uh, really become a point of discussion as a reference point, you know, in many ways, uh, for the reason that we are taking certain lessons from it. And my question is particularly related to the cyber warfare element, you know, so uh, there's this debate about the principles of war, how this changing character of warfare has actually made an impact on this principles of war. So how do you look at this cyber element making a change uh, or if, if, if any, you know, on these principles of war, the way we conduct the warfare? Thank you. It's a good question. And I think, but I, but I think the way that Russia has fought the war actually reduces the, the salience of, of the questions about cyber principles. In other words, I think there's more of a question in, for example, the Israel-Iran contest, which has been going on, and it largely as a cyber contest, um, or some of the, the, the stuff that's been um, not in the context of a large kinetic war where you're, you know, you've, you've lost, the U.S. believes Russia has 200,000 dead or wounded soldiers, and Ukraine's got 120,000, that was a few weeks ago, dead or wounded, let alone the civilians. So that context is very different than to be thinking about the cyber piece of it. But in a, in a, in a kind of contest where you're still not killing people, overtly, except if you're assassinating scientists or something. Uh, then there are questions about what, whether it's legal or not. Um, is, it, is, it, is it legal or right for, for my country to be in your country's networks and, and operating, or maybe to sabotage something? Uh, and, and so that's part of what's been an ongoing debate amongst the international uh, legal legal community um, but otherwise I, I, I it's a good set of questions I mean you're familiar with the UNGGE process which was developing norms on cyber context and like, like I said that was for peacetime but why I raise it is it, it would be a, an additional question that's interesting is well what about wartime and what do those same people and countries think about? kind of what does and doesn't apply in, in wartime. Yeah, sorry. Uh, one, two, uh, could you please be very, very concise? Thank you want to take them together and then I'll... Yeah, yeah. we can yeah. do that, yeah. Uh, hi, so uh, during this discussion, we have seen that you have, uh, the discussion has mainly been focused on large tech companies. And we have seen in the history in past and recent years as well that whenever there was, let's just say, a ransomware attack, the open source community came to the rescue and not these big tech companies. So uh, how do you think the open source community fits into all this cyber warfare thing? And secondly, as we see in the, in the Snowden leaks, uh, that uh, it showed that US has the capability to take down Japanese electricity grids if it needs to. So don't you think that acts as a deterrence for cyber warfare? Go ahead, thanks. How does work against uh, in those HP vulnerable things such as Spectre and Mind Bomb like such as in Intel processes? What is your opinion about using open source software and hardware to potential these things? So both questions are about open source and I don't I don't I don't know enough to give you a a, a good answer. I know that there are a couple of things going on just that I can tell you. For example, um, the US government has become conscious that, that a lot of critical systems, including our nuclear weapons systems, rely on open source software. And, and so they've got the Defense Advanced uh, Research DARPA, 
Defense Advanced Research, I forget the P is agency, uh, which is kind of the top defense scientist now looking at security issues arising from open source software and, and whether the, the vulnerabilities have been appreciated, but also whether there are other ways, as you're suggesting, that they can be advantageous. So I, I think this is a, a, a growing question. At the same time, there's a question about how to sustain the open source community, all right? Because if you have that, that capability, but the people who are producing it um, can't sustain themselves on their day jobs or, or otherwise, then what are the implications of that? And you know, Google in their layoffs laid off a bunch of their open source people. And so that's a question, it's not a technical question, which is what you were raising, but it's a broader question about the, the, the reliability or depending on, on open source capability. So I, I think there are a number of questions that are kind of coming up and out about open source. We just had a meeting last week with um, a, a, a real leader in artificial intelligence, a, a company, and they're quite worried about putting uh, very powerful algorithms uh, into as, as open source because they don't know whether these things are safe in the first place. And so if they're now widely available through open source, but you don't know if they're safe, and in fact, you can't even explain how they work, what would be the implications, and maybe they should be kept as, as closely held as, as possible rather than open source. But on the other hand, a lot of the people who are interested in doing the work are, are involved in open source. So it just is another one of those issues that seems to me there's like a whole lot of interesting questions that people need to address, and there are very few answers, which has been kind of the theme of the whole, the whole discussion, I guess. I think there needs to be some robustness in the standards, even that open source technologies must adhere to, right? Yeah. And we have no sense. I mean, in this discussion, this was a leading company begging, saying the U.S. government needs to regulate us. There are no rules. And they're saying this is so dangerous to not have any rules. Um, and I, I look at them saying the U.S. government's not going to regulate this. And we don't know how. I mean, you're not going to get Congress to agree and write legislation, you might get some executive agencies to do something. So this is some place where we're, uh, gonna, the government's going to be way behind the capability, and even the people producing the capability are wanting rules, and they're not going to get rules. Um, yeah. Thank you, George. I think I'll uh, no more. <laughs> All right, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is regarding uh, the companies, you said the companies are related to the Ukraine. I was short in the US elections in 2016, US elections, the 2018 Winter Olympics, and uh, the solar wind breach in 2020. Uh, where were these companies uh, uh, in these breaches when the USA was covering these breaches? And why are the US companies suddenly involved in Ukraine when uh, they couldn't be involved in all these breaches which US suffered? Also, relating it to a uh, report the European Special Task stated that. Uh, U.S. has uh, U.S. has uh, advanced. Uh, U.S. has made its uh, benefit from the Ukraine war uh, through oil prices because they sell oil uh, at, at an increased rate, and U.S. sells weapons at an increased rates to these countries uh, which are in war. So, are these related that the companies involved in, uh, in the Ukraine, which were not so present in uh, the breaches which U.S. suffered, and the uh, Europeans? Um, alleging U.S. Uh, for its gain from this war? So, I think the breaches, I, I, I can't give you a, a confident answer, but 2016 was, I, I'm willing to bet that the Democratic Party wasn't relying on the cloud in 2016, that these were servers on on-premise or controlled by the entity involved, which is one of the arguments for going to the cloud, but this wasn't as common uh, then. I can't speak to the to the Japanese uh, Olympics, um, but I don't. I don't. I think it's a different. The, the practices are, are a whole lot different. So I, as as much as people have investigated what happened in those instances, I don't think anybody has has suggested that 
that the tech companies were the problem. Uh, the Russians were involved in the cyber attacks in these incidences. Yeah, yes, but I, no one's, no one, I haven't ever heard that this was a lapse of the technology providers. What one would talk about is the practices of the comp of the entities that were um, penetrated. It was, it was their fault, basically, because it wasn't the cloud. They 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 were using their own, their own their own servers maintained by their own personnel uh, who were supposed to be updating them and monitoring them and so on. And like I say, this has become an argument uh, to move to the cloud so you don't have to rely on your own IT guy and the server down in the basement, but you have state-of-the-art services. We, we've been penetrated. I don't know how many times the FBI has come to my office and say, hey, the Russians are in your computer or the Chinese are in your computer or whatever. And I always say, actually, I want them there. Um, and then they don't laugh because FBI guys don't laugh that much. Um, <laughs> and they say, what are you crazy? And then people say, well, he is kind of crazy. And I say, no, I want the Russians to know I'm not working for the US government. So if they're reading all my stuff, they know actually that I'm, you know, that I'm not. And same with you. Anyway, um, so we solved that problem by hiring Microsoft and going to the cloud. Now the FBI doesn't come, and, um, but when it was my old IT guy and the server down there, they say, well, your server's outdated and the, you know, it's gotta be updated and so on. And so that's all happened in, 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 in very recent um, times. And in terms of the profiteering for the war, I, uh, I am prepared to be very critical of the US government, as all these guys know. Uh, I, I can assure you that there is no ulterior motive by the U.S. Uh, in in this war, and that there's um, somebody might be making money, but I but I I don't think there's any perception that somehow the U.S. is benefiting economically uh, from the war, or or that even if they were, that this would be something remotely um, uh, acceptable. Uh, people are appalled by the war. President Biden is personally, and from the very beginning, has been quite worried about the risk of escalation to nuclear war, which we take very seriously. Um, they're quite aware of how many people have been killed, and like I say, raped and tortured and everything else. And so it's not like a, you know, an Oliver Stone movie where somebody in some room has gone, oh, we can make some money on, on this. It's, it's a very serious thing that um, is beyond regrettable. Uh, and so, you know, yeah, there are probably economic implications, but I don't think that's anything uh, remotely like what's what's gone through the U.S. government on this. Yeah. And I think the first question also again harks back to you know the running theme in terms of you know there needing to be some norms and perhaps even a definition of what constitutes an act of war. Is yeah. it dependent on any act? Yeah. You know, do we look at the impact or the seriousness or degree of devastation? So, yeah. you know, yeah. um, I think with that, we come to the end of the session. Thank you once again, George, for that illuminating yeah. talk. Yeah. And uh, thank you to all of you for engaging with the discussion. Um, have a great evening. Thanks, Thanks. again. Thanks, everybody.